Thank you, Mrs. Green. You have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. And if you need a handout, if you'd raise your hand there as we look at this series, What is Church? And so if you need one, just raise your hand. The ushers will come through. They'll give you one if you'd like to take some notes in there. And I will do my best not to miss any of the blanks. I am notorious for missing blanks. I am quite accomplished at it. And they can be on the paper, but I can skip over them quickly. If I do, please do not raise your hand or throw something at me. Um, it won't make a difference. I won't acknowledge you, and I won't come back to it. I'll get you it later on, all right? So there's some up here, men, who need some handouts. Anyone else? Some up here? All right, get that if you need one. They're bringing those around. First Timothy chapter 3 is where we'll be at as we look at what is church. Uh, as we went through 2020 and all the different, oh boy, just ways we had to navigate that time, I thought it as we began 2021, a fitting time to come back to what is church. See, church is not our idea. We didn't men didn't get together and say, hey, let's have a, a group that meets and we'll meet Sunday morning and maybe we'll meet Sunday night and maybe we'll meet, meet Wednesday night and boy, that'll be a neat idea. Church wasn't our idea. Church is found and founded in God's word. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus says unto Peter, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church is God's idea. Church is the call out a group of believers who assemble around and assemble, assemble together for Jesus Christ. We are not here just because we're all friends, though I hope all that are here are friends. We are not here just because we have similar hobbies, though we have some with similar hobbies. There are a number of ladies who enjoy shopping and spending money. There's a number of men who enjoy shopping and spending money. Different stores, different amounts, but they're similar hobbies. Men who enjoy hunting here. Ladies who enjoy collecting shoes and purses. We're not here just because it's a neat little hobby club. We can have a good time together. Though I hope we have a good time together. You know it's okay to smile in church? I'm going to say that again because some of you don't believe me. I've now been pastor almost two years. And, and, and heaven help me if I've ever seen you smile in church. It's okay to smile in church. And uh, there was, years ago, uh, different religious uh, peoples that did not believe, believe that you should laugh at church. Right? And that, that's, that's fine, but, but I don't find that in the Bible. I find joy and mirth and things like that in the Bible. And the joy of the Lord and the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And that's just not an inner joy. Right? Sometimes, well, well, brother, I have joy. It's deep. It's a river of water inside my soul. Now, joy ought to come from the inside, but what's on the inside, Jesus says, will show up on the outside. So if you're sour on the outside, you're just showing us what's on the inside. But I'm way off base already tonight, all right? I've got to get back on here. But we ought to have a good time at church, but that's not why we come to church, just to have a good time. We did find, and many have said this, that some time when we were just online that you miss some elements of church. You miss some of the fellowship. You miss the encouragement. You miss the worship together. Some key parts of church. So because of that, I thought that we ought to, as a church, look at what is a church. And Lord willing, we'll finish this particular section tonight. Next week, the Shears will be here, Chad and Marcia Shear, and we'll have a beginning of the service right in here, and then we'll split off, and the ladies will be in here, and the men will be, uh, I believe, in the chapel based on the numbers we have there. And, uh, we'll have, and then when we come back the following week, I'll pick back up with the next part of this series, uh, and the title of that is Which Church? But then as we finish up, what is church? The elements of church have gone through a number of them already. I will not take the time to, to go back through. If you missed some of those things or missed tonight, they are on YouTube, on the live stream, and I think all the tech team and all that they do to get those things on. But tonight, I'd like to get those last three areas, some key elements of a local church, and beginning with that one that's labeled in your notes, leadership. You know that in the Bible, God set up leadership for a church. Though we are a congregation, as a part of a local assembly, I am no more important than you and you than me. But we are called to different tasks. 
And God has called me as a pastor different tasks than you as a member. It's the way God has set it up. Now, we know that in other areas. We know that at a job. At a job, someone has to make a decision. Not everyone can have equal say or nothing will get done. But just because somebody makes a decision doesn't make them a better person. It just, I think from the Bible, puts more responsibility on them. We had a tremendous, I believe, tremendous stewardship month and a tremendous stewardship banquet, and many people um, took part in that and with other further commitments. And I appreciate your faithfulness. I was talking to someone recently, or just this past week, about the finances, and I let them know with great joy that 2020 was the, the greatest financial year that the First Baptist Church has ever had. That is the hand of God and the faithfulness of his people. Right? That, that is only God, Right? through his people. But in that, it falls to me as pastor to look at how we spend those funds. I do not take that lightly. I do not take that uh, frivolously. I do not loosely say, oh, it doesn't matter. I answer for that to the Lord. And we all answer for what we're called to do inside of the church. We'll look at tonight the parts, but tonight look at leadership. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 1, where the Bible says, This is a true saying. If the man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, or if I can, in the same manner, must the deacons... Be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. Lord, I ask for your help. And Lord, as we look at these elements of what is church, Lord, would you help us as we look at your word and enlighten those, uh, those areas, Lord, maybe that we have not followed you completely in Lord, may you touch us tonight in this service. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible here in 1 Timothy speaks of some leadership at church. I want to tonight just for a little bit of time talk and, and speak on what that is supposed to look like. We believe the Bible gives two offices of leadership at a church. Pastor. And deacon. And I think those may be blanks on your paper. Did I miss that or no? Those blanks or no? All right. But so if you got blanks, you might as well write them in. Or else you're going to miss them and raise your hand. And I won't acknowledge you and you'll feel terrible and miss the rest of the sermon. Pastor, deacon. Two offices. But what does that look like and what is that supposed to be like inside of a local church? Oh, well, what is the responsibilities? Uh, uh, how does that work out? Is it, is it the fact that uh, the pastor um, does everything and the deacons do nothing? Or the, do the deacons, are they supposed to make all the decisions? Sometimes churches will have, instead of a pastor, they'll have elders. And I find in Scripture, though, the use of the elders, I find that in this passage specifically, God sets up very clear authority structure. In that we see, first of all, a pastor. Paul says in another place, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, 
to feed the church of God with he has purchased with his own blood. I'll give you a few words that I believe describe what a pastor is supposed to be like from the Bible. He's supposed to be an overseer. An overseer. I'm supposed to look over the affairs of not only the church, but the people of the church. That means I'm supposed to care about you. Oh, I'm out. No, no. I'm supposed to care about you. I'm supposed to care not just how you're doing and what you're going through, but also how you're doing spiritually. I'm supposed to care if you come to church or don't come to church. I'm supposed to care that if I see you doing something that I think, boy, that could have some serious ramifications. I'm called to be an overseer. Now, I'm not called to lord over you, if I may, but understand that I'm, I'm called to, to look and say, boy, I, I want you to be presented faultless before Jesus Christ. I'm called to preach. I'm called to teach. I'm called to help direct the affairs of the church. But the Bible has some requirements for the pastor. Found in 1 Timothy, there's some words I want to go through tonight, what that's supposed to look like. What's interesting is that with a pastor, there is nothing in this passage said for his love for God. Now, it does talk about that for deacons. That is not an accident, not a mistake. I think we can safely say it's assumed that the pastor ought to love God. Is that, is that not a pretty good assumption? All right, they ought to be saved. <laughs> Okay, all right, just, just so you say, well, pastor, I don't see where you have to be saved in there. Okay, I think we can kind of assume that because Paul's main message of the New Testament is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, he calls Timothy his son in the faith, all right? He's assuming he's saved. He's assuming he's growing. Now he comes to basically some nitty-gritty, what is it supposed to look like? Some words he uses, he uses the word blameless. It doesn't mean perfect, and I'm glad because I'd never qualify for perfect. Blameless means hopefully there's no handle, no accusations that stick. They say this, the husband of one wife. Now some men have tried to reinterpret what that says. And they, I couldn't believe, it. I didn't know this was a thing, but it's a thing. And they say, well, the husband of one wife, what that really means is one at a time. One at a time, really. So as long as you have one at a time, you can have 30 or 40 or 50. It doesn't really matter one at a time. I would think that if you got into the multiple wives scenario, you probably have to go back to that blameless category. I believe in this passage that that verse clearly indicates that a pastor um, shouldn't be divorced. Now, we have some excellent people who in our church who are wonderful church members, and, and if you've been divorced, there's a divorce in your, path, in your past. I don't for a moment want to think or say or imply that God cannot use you, all right? And, and I, I would shudder for you to walk out and say, well, pastor says I'm just a second-class citizen in, in God's economy. That is not the case. That is not the case at all. But for the pastor, God has set up some very high and clear uh, um, requirements, he says, this is a husband of one wife, and I, I don't believe you can alter it. What I see in the scripture is the only thing that releases someone from marriage is death. And the Bible teaches that. And so it's not just one at a time. And that doesn't mean that someone cannot serve here at First Baptist Church, and many of you are aware of that, but it means that they couldn't be the pastor here. It also is clear to me when the Bible says, husband of one wife, that they would be male. Read it, right? Am I reading into that passage? I don't think so. Look at it. The Bible says husband of one wife. There is a large movement that says, well, the, the wife of the pastor should also be a pastor. You know, there's Pastor Howell and Pastor Doreen. I don't find that in the scripture because it's hard for her to be a husband of one wife unless we really twist some things. But it, there's an absolute movement. I'm not talking about just in, in, in other denominations inside of Baptist churches, okay, where even pastor and the wife's first name will preach on Mother's Day. 
tremendous sermon by, and, and I heard the pastor who went to a good college, a good Baptist college. It was a tremendous message by my wife, and she's going to preach for us like she did last year. I'm sorry. If that's what you want, you won't find it here while I'm the pastor. All right now, on a side note, you better be glad Doreen's not preaching. A few things she has to say. Not just Doreen, I'm not picking on Doreen, all you wives. <laughs> I got something for my husband today, you know, are you listening up, you know? <laughs> you know, Jim back there, Jim, you listening up? So Pam's got a few things to say to you. And uh, <laughs> No, but I, I don't find that in the Bible. Can, can you see the husband of one wife? It, it, there are other passages, but I think it's really clear in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Boy, it solves it right there. Continue, it says vigilant or being cautious, sober, means self-controlled. Good behavior, to be modest in attitude or not supposed to be a hot shot. Given to hospitality, the pastor is supposed to be kind to others. I try to be kind, and as I studied for this thing, I thought, man, I, I don't fit many of these things in the sense that, yeah, boy, you, just, you, you, you fall short. I wish I was kinder. Well, I like that, John. The fact is that we want to love each other. I want to do the best we can. I do love the children here at First Baptist Church and the teenagers, sometimes more than adults, just so you know. That's why if a kid comes up and I'm talking to one of the adults, don't get mad at me. I will stop the conversation with you and talk to the child. I find that in Scripture. Jesus said that. Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not from such is the kingdom of heaven. And if they're in the kingdom of heaven, I want it close to them. And I love those little kids. And I tell you what, we have some of the best kids here at First Baptist Church. You see them serving. I love it when they sing that song, I'm so blessed. Wasn't your heart stirred by that? That's our kids. The parents overall, I'm, I'm happy with the parents of First Baptist Church, though I will be preaching a series, First Baptist Church. I believe the name will be, the title will be How to Ruin Your Kids. All right, 10 Ways to Ruin Your Children. And uh, you want to come to that. It's not next week or not tonight. I won't digress tonight. You have to come back for that. But I'm thankful for the kids. I want to be kind, and, and I hope you're kind to children. I hope you're kind of the children at First Baptist Church. Listen, if they're not yours, be kind to them. Unless they're hurting themselves, unless they're hurting themselves, keep it inside. All right, if you have a serious issue, go home. Pray about it. Come back to church. Go back home. Pray about it some more. Come talk to me. I'll send you back home, and then maybe I'll let you talk to a parent. Now, listen, I want you. Now, with me, you can be different. You send my kids doing something, you come tell me right away. All right, but sometimes people take it upon themselves to be the children police at a church. Now, some people do not want their kids to run in the auditorium. Right, and I'm okay if you don't want your children to run the auditorium. I typically don't allow mine to run much in here. But I want my kids to have a good time at church. We clean here on Sundays, all right, the, my family and I. And almost every time they get done, they ask if they can, my kids can, and they ask if they can run down that ramp over there. And they take a ramp, and they love going up there and running out as fast as they can down that ramp. I'm happy. I don't think that displeases the Lord at all. I want these kids to enjoy coming to church and have a good time, and they ought to enjoy the people. And some of you have been so gracious to the children, mine and others as well, and, and you bring candy to church, and I appreciate that. I really do. Now, just so you know, if you give my kids candy, I have usually asked them not to eat it till they check with me. What happens is so many people are kind, but by the time Sunday school's over, they are high on sugar. I don't know about your kids, but mine don't do as well high on sugar. All right, and now they're not just running, they're jumping from the balcony to the floor. Now we're making trips to the hospital. But you are so kind, and, and uh, I appreciate that so much. Kindness to others, but I'm supposed to lead the way in that. The pastor, the Bible says apt to teach or to give instruction, not given to wine. For more talk on that, the series on alcohol is online. Go back and watch it. Listen to it again. If you wonder what I think about alcohol, I'll surmise it. It has no place in the Christian's life. Further. Further questions, watch the thing and come talk to me. Not a striker, not quarrelsome, not greedy, a filthy lucre, patient or moderate, not a brawler, the Bible says, peaceable, not covetous. I'm supposed to be content. 
One who the Bible says rules his own house well. You see, the way I'm supposed to be at home is the way I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be authentic. Hopefully my kids see the same person. And that, Lord willing, my house will be run well at home. I try to run it well. I pray often, Lord, help me not mess up my kids. If it's just me and my flesh, I'm going to mess my kids up. As all parents will without Jesus Christ. They have a way of finding those things and knowing the things that you don't want them to know. They, they, they do those things. I don't know about you parents, but I've heard my kids say things. I'm like, hey, where'd you hear that? Oh, boy. Where? You know, don't use that tone. Oh, boy. I can't always blame their mother. It's right here. Rules his own house well. Not a novice. Not supposed to be my first day. Not my first rodeo. I have a good report from those without. There's also some stipulations for the deacons. Now, it goes on for the deacons, and we have wonderful men here. Had a deacons meeting Sunday night. Went over the affairs of the church, and we'll have a business meeting the 24th of February. Not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday after the service, our business meeting, uh, and vote on the budget for the year. And we have 10 amazing deacons here at First Baptist Church. They care about the church here at First Baptist Church. They care about the affairs of the church. They care about the finances. They care about the people here. They care that things are done well. And, and they're so gracious to me. They want to make sure that I'm taking the time and doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing as well. And they're, they're so gracious. But the Bible talks about their, their requirements as well. The Bible says they're supposed to be grave or honorable and honest. It says they're not supposed to be double-tongued. The deacons are not supposed to say different things to different people. They're supposed to be the same. Now, for them, the Bible says, not given to much wine. Now, let me just pause here real quick on this particular point so you understand. It says for the pastors, not given to wine. And it says for the deacons, not given to much wine. And so at first glance, someone would say, well, the deacons are, can drink a little bit, but pastors not at all. As you continue on in the passage, you'll see that the deacons' wives, the, the word in the Bible, are supposed to be sober. Uh, chapter 3, and uh, I think it's verse number 11, sober. That word sober there in the passage for the deacons' wives means to abstain from wine. And then in Titus it says for the elder women, all right, to, I think it's elder, or, uh, elder women are not to be given to much wine. If we were to just take not given and given to wine and much wine without understanding the context of what the Bible is saying, it would say that the pastors cannot drink, but the deacons can. The deacons' wives cannot, but the old ladies in the church can. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Not, 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 not a lick of sense. All right, what? Paul is saying, Timothy, is listen, stay away from alcoholic beverage. That's what he's saying. Deacons as well. It says, not greedy and filthy lucre, but then it says these words in uh, verse number nine, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. What that means is that their lives ought to match the gospel, the mystery of the faith in good conscience. Their lives ought to match what Paul has preached. So these deacons, the deacons, the, the other office in a church, they're supposed to be good, respectable Christians, ones that are noticeably Christian. Ones that have a, a strong reputation for love for God, holding the mystery of the faith in good conscience. Their lives match their beliefs. I'm honored that one of our deacons is Brother Lee Edwards, a man of faith. There's not a person in this room who I believe could level an honest accusation about Lee Edwards. Is he perfect? No. He'll be the first to tell you that. I respect him very, very much, in case you wondered. Love that man. I appreciate his counsel and wisdom. I usually call him Dr. Edwards. I think he's that wise. I talk to him. I love He comes to school camp with us, and he often uh, stays with me at school camp, and I love to let him talk. I think it's safe to say that Brother Edwards' life matches the gospel made choices throughout his life, and that's supposed to be for the deacons, and, and we go on and on about the deacons about that. Blameless, and the husband of one wife, same as the pastor, a deacon, cannot be divorced. And the, it says that the deacons, they must rule their children and their houses well. 
still alive. Rule their children and house as well. That means they're supposed to be fair and equitable with their house, with their finances, so that they can help manage the affairs of the church as well. The wives of deacons, the Bible says, grave, it means honorable, not slanderers. Sober, abstaining from wine and faithful in all things. You see, the Bible gives us these two avenues of leadership. You say, well, pastor, why do you spend time on this? Uh, because there are, there's other denominations that have different leadership in place at churches. There are some denominations where the church is not run here. It's run from another place in another part of the country. And the pastor is not really in charge of the church. It's just he's stuck here. And when his time here is done, this organization now moves him over here for this church and for this church. And Paul says in the church, there are two offices, right? There's the bishop or the pastor and the deacon. You don't find here in this passage assistant pastors. We find that as a help, they help assist the operation, assistant pastor, right? Assistant to the pastor. See how that works? Well, that's neat. That's wonderful. That's why with assistant pastors as a church, we don't vote on those. All right, I have from our constitution the full authority to hire, and if we need to, fire the assistants. But for the pastor, the congregation votes on him as he should. For the deacon, votes on them as they should. The two offices. Two more tonight, though. I want to continue on and not lose place and not finish. The next one is this, another essential part of local church, unity. Unity. Ephesians chapter 4, the verses are in your notes. The Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, may you increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Unity is doing my part, what I am called to do. We all have a part of the local church once we join the church. Unity does, unity does not mean that we will always agree on everything. We will not agree, all agree, on the colors that should be on the walls at First Baptist Church. If we take a poll, we will have almost as many colors as we ask people. We will not all agree always on the types of seating that we should have at First Baptist Church. At some point, we need to redo our auditorium. At that point, we'll cross the bridge whether we stay with pews or go to chairs. And some have very strong opinions about that, and I'm happy to hear them. I, I don't discount them. But unity does, does not mean that we all have to agree what the best thing to sit on is. We all have wonderful reasons. Unity does not mean that we'll always all agree uh, on a, exactly what the order of the service should be. Unity does mean that we must agree on the big things on the big things. Uh, last year, we did some changes on the stage here at First Baptist Church. Remember that? Some of you are like, oh yeah, Pastor, I remember. You painted the wood black. It's not a secret, it's right there, right? And some were a little nervous about, about us painting wood. Now I'm just pausing here real quick on painting wood. I'm happy to have a painting wood conversation. I grew up painting. I've been painting since the fourth grade. Uh, I was paid for it many, many years. Some would have called me a professional painter. Painted with my father. We painted house, uh, many houses, uh, some worth over a million dollars. I've painted a lot. You know that most, uh, or a lot, of the, a lot of the trim in those houses, they were white. You know what they were made from? Wood. We painted wood. 
You say, well, well that, was, that, that was oak you painted. Okay, so we can paint poplar, but we can't paint oak. Is that the conversation? Well, it had varnish on it. Okay, so you, can't, you can paint oak if it's not varnished, but you can't paint varnished oak. All right, my point is not whether we ought to paint wood, wood or not paint wood. My point is that's not where the unity or disunity should come from. We're all going to have little different views on that. And I mentioned this last time. When I did some of these things and, and had these changes made to, to paint some of that black, it was not to, to shock you, but to bring the attention where I think it ought to be, up this direction right here. And many of you don't remember, but, but find an old picture, and you'll find golden oak all behind us with light chairs. All right? And my wife and I did a lot of photography throughout the years, and I had to study some of these things. And I found that, that in, in the human eye, it tends to, to go in, in a certain pattern in a picture, in a, in a place where you're looking. And it'll like wander around and a photographer tries to get your eyes right to where it's supposed to be. I was sitting here one day and I'm like, man, when I sit there, my eyes go like all over the place. I can't figure out where to let them rest. So that's why I thought, you know, we need to make a couple of changes to maybe bring our eyes right where they're supposed to be. When someone's singing, bring it right to the singers. Not to glorify the singers, that's not the point. But I don't want someone distracted by some golden oak trim if it can be avoided. And then, you know, a few years back, we put the bigger screens in. Why? I wanted to get the cross displayed. I love the cross back. They're all lit up. I'm happy for it. My point is this, though. If you don't like that or do like that, it doesn't particularly matter. In our house, in the decorations, my wife and I don't always have unity on the little things. My wife is an excellent decorator. I'm happy to paint whatever color she wants and repaint. I grew up painting. Painting does not bother me. Every time you paint a room, it gets quicker because it gets smaller with every coat of paint. And so, man, after a while, after 15 coats, it's practically uh, three minutes and then the room is done. She wants to paint this or do this, that's fine. Sometimes I'm like, honey, I don't see it right now. But you know what? And some of those things, I don't care. Other things I care about. But you know what I do care about? I do care about in my marriage being unified with my wife. You know, and if she wants to paint, me to paint the bedroom some crazy color that I don't like, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Because I love my wife. And I'm married to her. I don't really care what color the bedroom is or the hallway or the bathroom. It doesn't make a difference to me. Unity says... I don't have to care about the small things, but I ought to care and be unified together on the big, big things. What are the big things? The faith, the unity of the faith of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible talks about what happens if there's discord. Paul says in Corinthians, for ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? And there have been church, churches and church after church that have split because they didn't like the color of the carpet. Now, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. Maybe you don't like it. But who cares? But who cares? On the carpet? Now, if you don't agree on the doctrines of the faith, the gospel, on Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, that's a big deal. But these small things... Oh, pastor wants me to change seats sometimes. I do. I want you to meet new people at church. I want you to fellowship like a church, right? Not just in your little clique. But don't get up in arms about that. Get up in arms about people who are lost and dying and going to hell. Well, I don't like that pastor put those blue lights back by the cross. I think they should be green. Christmas, they were red. And they should have been yellow. You're free to tell me, and I'll listen. I listen. I, I want your input. I absolutely do. But let's not get weighed down by those, by those things. In fact, the Bible says in Titus, Paul says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. You know what the foundation of that word heretic is? In Titus 3.10, one who cause schisms or divisions. Paul says it's a big deal to cause a division. Sowing discord. And, I, and listen, if you ever have a problem, come and talk to me. I will listen. And those who have talked to me know that I will listen and, and I, will, I will hear you out. 
it's never right to go to somebody else. It never is. And I'm not saying that because I know a problem with First Baptist Church. I'm just saying the unity of the church is important. Unity is seeking a higher good than my current in irritation. Unity sees the grander picture and the greater cause. The two blanks there in unity, I have my part. I do my part. We all have a part here at First Baptist Church. Bible says, uh, Paul says we're like a body. Hands, knees, eyes. We all have a part. And if you don't do your part, if we're not unified, the body doesn't work as well. We all, all, all ought to have the passion of unity. Hey, we want to stay unified in this. God is doing something here. The last element tonight kind of ties into that is a common mission. We all have a common mission, and that mission found in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I see an element of the local church. Church found in the New Testament was they had a common mission. They wanted to see other people saved, baptized, and discipled. I hope that you do not come to First Baptist Church just to get out of the cold weather. I hope you don't come to First Baptist Church just because you feel guilty if you don't come. I hope you come to First Baptist Church because you believe it is a church that God wants you at. I hope you come to First Baptist Church because you understand there's a mission that God has given to us and it is to advance the kingdom of God and seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We're supposed to reach people with the gospel, people baptized by immersion and people discipled in the truths of Jesus Christ. Our job does not stop when someone gets saved. Our job is merely beginning. At First Baptist Church, we need to get back to our common mission. That's why in April we're having a soul-winning conference here at First Baptist Church. I'm going to invite other churches, but this conference is for First Baptist Church, for us, for me, for you to get back on track with our common mission, to reach the lost. We are surrounded, not just in the world, but in Bridgeport, Birch Run, Saginaw, the township in Clio, Bird, wherever you're from, we're surrounded by people who are lost and dying and going to hell. And we have the truth. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have freedom from bondage. We have the keys to godly living. We have the answer. We have true hope. How dare we neglect our obligation? First Baptist Church has a common mission. I remember years ago when we first began the Reformers Unanimous Ministry at First Baptist Church. Years and years. Some will remember that. Some, uh, many have been added since that point to the church. Those who come to Reformers, I'm so thankful for Pastor Scott and the ministry here. But I remember at first there were some, not many, but some in the church who weren't happy that sinners were coming to church. That's the bottom line. They weren't happy about sinners coming to church. I had someone say to me, I was a youth pastor at that time, young, snotty-nosed youth pastor, not like Pastor Ryan, he's accomplished and wise. He's a lot better youth pastor than I ever was. But I remember someone saying when they had moved their seat, well, I don't want to sit by those people. You know how the Bible says a pastor is not supposed to be a striker? It took everything in me I, I, before the Lord not to knock them out upside the head. All right, because Jesus loves those broken or, or those people who are broken. And I'm a broken person. But I thank God for the maturity and growth of this church that we are thankful for everyone who comes. No one is labeled here at First Baptist Church. All right, first time, last time, it doesn't matter. You come here, and I hope you find the common mission. Listen, if you're saved, time to grow. If you're not saved, time to get saved. Have you been baptized yet? Can we teach you about the Bible? Can, can you go out and win someone else to Jesus Christ? We're on a common mission. And sure, you may have a problem, but I've got a problem too. 
and Jesus can fix both of the problems. I think it's the way church is supposed to be. And we have, a, we have been blessed with a tremendous church, a tremendous group of people who now, now we see, love to see people changed by the gospel. No matter their age, no matter their status, and no matter their issues. Because we all got them. And I'm thankful for the church. It wasn't man's idea. I wish it had been my idea, because it's a good idea. But it's his idea. Lord, help us to do our part in church. Lord, we don't want to step away from what the direction you've given to us about the church. Lord, we're thankful for this particular church and the people here. But Lord, may we stay on task and stay focused for you. Lord, would you keep us unified? Would you keep us on task for the mission? Lord, I think now specifically of, of the outdoor night next Thursday, Lord, and a chance for many lost people to come. And I pray that that night we have this place filled with those who don't know you as their Savior. And Lord, I pray that next Thursday that the gospel would be clear and evident. When I think of the lady who got saved last week at the teen service and the answer to prayer, Lord, we're so gracious to see you work here on a regular basis. Lord, thank you for church. We sure love you. In Jesus' name, amen.